at Jamelia, and I'm very glad to be able to uh, moderate this um, very interesting webinar that we have you have planned for us today. So without further ado, um, we can go ahead and get started with our first presenter. And um, Evan Timmy from, with a Master's in Public Health from the Arizona TB Control Program um, is going to start us off and talk about identifying co-infection of tuberculosis and coxie. All right, thank you. So uh, I have no conflicts of interest and I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, as a surveillance epidemiologist for Arizona, I work mostly on the data TB reporting that we have as well as also the case messaging for our uh, reported information. Uh, we also review and conduct uh, pharmacy reporting information for surveillance purposes, and we also do some type of surveillance matching with data sets like uh, hospital discharge data or also death data. So as a public health program, we have some good available data sets that are useful for us. So what I want to do is be able to cover and share an approach and also the benefits to cross-matching available data sets from a public health perspective. And then I also want to uh, review for this particular webinar the TB and COXI cross-match that we did. Uh, so uh, what we're going to be doing is also covering some of the differences that we've identified between our TB-only population and our tb COXI population. Uh, so from a public health perspective for our TB program, we have a lot of local level influence and a lot of local level efforts that go into collecting a comprehensive uh, TB data set. And that includes uh, about 200 uh, data points that we systematically collect and also uh, review that's available for public health practice. And that includes doing uh, assessments on subset groups like healthcare personnel or persons developed with um, who developed TB after a organ transplant, and also for this particular example, uh, the comparison between TB and COXI populations. In our review, we looked at uh, the population time frame for 2009 to 2016. And uh, to place this in a little bit of context, which I think is important, is that we had during that time frame over 70,000 persons with a positive COXI test and also over 700 or 1750 for TB. Uh, for COXI, that's about the number of persons who lived in Camden, New Jersey. And for TB, that's comparable to a moderate-sized high school, to give it a little com, uh, context. So for our interest uh, for our group, what we wanted to do was look at the overlap portion between TB and COXI and TB. And we used a deterministic and probabilistic approach and we use name, sex, date of birth, and zip code as a flex. And for this, what we're focusing on is just the TB, COXI, and TB portion. So we were able to identify during this process about 150 individuals who had TB and COXI, uh, and that accounted for 9% of our total TB cases during that time period. Using the data for TB data diagnosis, we were also able uh, to notice that there was a dip in the proportion of TB COXI persons after the year of 2012. This also mimics a decrease in the overall reported case count of COXI within Arizona. For the remaining information, I'm going to talk about the comparison that we did for TB uh, reported information. So there was some early discussion about the culture positivity and if persons with TB and COXI were more likely to be culture negative than culture positive. Uh, however, we found that there was no difference between the culture positivity of the two groups. We also looked at country of birth to assess if there were any differences, and we were able to find that there was a difference between the TB only group versus the TB COXI group where persons with TB and COXI were more likely to be U.S. born. We, as a public health group, also collect information on TB treatment completion. And what we found was that there was a noticeable difference in the treatment completion between TB COXI and TB only, where we saw greater completion of treatment for persons that had TB and COXI. It's also important to have chest imaging when assessing these two different types of morbidities. And what we were able to look at was finding that there were uh, cavitary notations 
uh, more likely for persons with TB and COXI compared to our TB only population. We did the same assessment looking at miliary, and what we found was a, a similar finding that persons with TB and COXI were more likely to have a miliary abnormality reported compared to persons with TB only. Uh, and then lastly, I want to touch on the time component. So when we look at the difference between the time of TB workup and the time of COXI workup, and so we found that over 75% of TB COXI persons had their TB workup and a positive COXI test within one year of each other. When looking at six months or less, we identified that 70% of these individuals had their workup within six months or less. And then when looking at 30 days or less, we were able to identify that more about 50% of the TB COXI persons had their TB workup and also a positive COXI lab within 30 days of each other. Uh, for a slight recap and review, uh, what we identified was no difference in culture positivity, but we did identify differences in our population for individuals that were born within the U.S., uh, completed treatment, had cavitary and miliary chest imaging that was abnormal for the TB COXI compared to the TB only. And we also identified that TB COXI was being worked up within 50% or more of the people within 30 days. Hi, this is Sherry. I'm the nurse coordinator here at the state of Arizona. And I am now going to kind of uh, talk about how these numbers how we see it kind of reflecting um, with patients in Arizona. So these are three examples, I call them three highlights, that kind of highlight what we're kind of interested in and kind of why we actually started this, this cross match between TB and COXI. Um, so by the way, this is our beautiful desert. So if you think desert is ugly, you can look at this picture and say like, oh no, it's beautiful in here in Arizona at times. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, by the way, these are vignettes, they're case examples. The case management is not done here at the state level, it's done by our local health departments. Um, and then direct patient care is also done, you know, in the hospitals and correctional facilities. So I do want to give a shout out to all of our local partners and the great job that they do. Um, and uh, if you haven't already noticed, when we say COXIE, we're really talking about valley fever. We're just using that as a shorthand because it's easier than saying coccidiomycosis. Okay, so number one, there is value for TB programs in thinking COXI when thinking TB. Case in point, um, this is an example of a U.S.-born white male who was hospitalized in another state um, with a left upper lobe cavity, and they called because, you know, it was concerning when somebody who was a commercial airline pilot who travels internationally might have TB. Um, that's going to be a big impact, like, you know, can he actually come back to Arizona and is there going to be a giant contact investigation? So, of course, what we want is we want the three sputums for AFB smear and culture, um, preferably with a rapid test. And the reality is, is, though, statistically, it's more likely to be COXI. And Evan kind of, you know, showed you the difference in the numbers. And uh, oftentimes we refer to uh, the online resources for people who are not uh, familiar with COXI and how they can work it up. And the majority of this webinar is going to be one of the uh, experts talking on how to do that. So clinical snapshot on this individual. So he presented um, because of pain on his left side, um, and it was bad enough that uh, he presented when he was not at home. And when they found that uh, left upper lobe cavitary lesion, um, they did an x-ray, then they wanted to do further workup. So the CT scan, you can see the size of the cavitary mass and that there was also a right upper lobe um, six millimeter nodule. The QFT was negative. AFDs were all smear negative, and they were collected greater than eight hours apart. They also did a bronch that was also smear negative. Um, and then the COXI stuff all came back positive. So he was actually ruled out as not TB, and all of those uh, samples were set up for culture. Um, eventually they all came back as no MTB was detected, there was no growth. Um, so that is a good sign. So basically, he was ruled out. As um, being in public health for TB, we do not follow COXI patients. So I cannot tell you what happened with this patient from the COXI side of things, if that was what the main issue was. But this is just to show the value of finding a differential diagnosis. 
because chances are that it's more likely to be Coxie here in Arizona than it is to be TB. Last year, there was 44 times more Coxie reported than tuberculosis. But at the same time, these, these two squares, I don't have them set up correctly. Um, so they really should be overlapping instead of being separate. Because um, as Evan showed, that it can be Coxie and TB at the same time. Um, so with that data cross-match, it was found that 9% of the patients diagnosed with TB were also had uh, Coxie. So to kind of show you where that falls with our risk factors here in Arizona, this is just one year snapshot. Um, that's less than diabetes, but it is more than our HIV co-infection. Now, the other thing we don't know, we don't know how many TB patients are actually being tested for Coxie, so this might be lower than what the reality is. We just don't know. We don't have that data available. When you look at it from the Coxie side of things, you might say, oh, well, you know, it, it, TB isn't that common. It's not likely to be TB, which is true. But people with uh, valley fever are more likely to have um, tuberculosis than somebody that doesn't. So you can see that the case rate during that time period for people that were reported to have valley fever was about 205 per 100,000, which is compared to 3.3 per 100,000 Arizonans during that same time period. Time period. So that's a difference of 62 times. So here's a case in point of why uh, people should be worked up for both at the same time. Again, another U.S.-born white male. Um, so originally, you know, presented uh, with cough, night sweats, unintentional weight loss, uh, fatigue. Three months in, you know, his x-ray had, a, again, a left upper lobe cavity, um, started on fluconazole, uh, still wasn't getting better, so had a biopsy. Um, the AFB stain was negative. I don't know if it was sent for culture because uh, he wasn't being worked up by the TB program, and so we have limited information on what actually happened. But he did continue to see the doctor. So, like, they found that he had diabetes, um, and then on month nine, they decided to uh, do to take out the left upper lobe. And it was at that time um, that they found that the lung fluid was 4 plus AFB um, with necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. Um, and the day after the surgery, a QFT was done. That was positive. Five days after the surgery, the first sputum was collected. NAA detected MTB. There was no rare sampling mutation. It was smear negative, and that's when uh, the gentleman started on for a drug treatment. So the first month of treatment was a little bit rough, um, but not necessarily because of tuberculosis. And he did show really good response to treatment. Um, it took care of all his signs and symptoms. Um, and he was started at seven days per week um, treatment. Um, towards the end of treatment, it was moved down to three times per week. And he did successfully tr complete treatment. And that's kind of our third point, is that even though people can be very ill when they have TB and Coxie, it is still curable. We found no difference in the TB treatment outcomes. Actually, uh, Evan showed that it was actually a little bit better. So uh, that is a plus. Um, and this is, again, another example of an individual who was very, very ill. Um, and again, another US-born white male. He was hospitalized for six weeks. And this is all the different things that he was hospitalized with. And that's just to show you the, the degree of illness that he had. Um, so he actually presented with um, abdominal pain, and he was known to have um, swollen lymph nodes for quite a while that hadn't been followed up because of insurance issues. And um, eventually what they found out is that it was disseminated TB, and he had um, coxie at the same time. Um, and the smear negative VAL did grow out MTB. It was pan susceptible. And this is what x-ray looked like. That way, if you're curious about what people – um, what it looks like when people have both. They don't always have cavities. Case management uh, was successful. It was challenging because of the insurance issues, and they did focus on making sure that he did have access to treatment for uh, valley fever through gain insurance and make sure he had fluconazole, and that was the big challenge. But he was successfully treated, um, and that's just to show that uh, it, it can be possible. The very last thing I want to uh, show is this great poster from New Mexico. Um, and I had somebody uh, ask me before, which one has Coxie and which one has TB? And I think the point is, is that you don't know by looking at the chest x-ray. 
um, that you have to do the test. If you're not looking for both of them at the same time, then you might not know. And with that, I will hand it over. Thank you very much, Sherry and Evan, both. That was a great introduction and laying the groundwork to some epi information and to some interesting case studies. And um, I would like to let everyone know, um, before I introduce the next speaker, as um, he's presenting, if you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat box, and we will be monitoring those and do have time at the end um, to answer questions. And some of the questions um, he may um, be able to answer as he's going along in his presentation if it happens to be appropriate, but we will definitely get to your questions at the end of the presentation. So um, I would like to um, introduce uh, our main speaker today, and it's um, Dr. John Galgiani. He is the director of the Valley Fever Center for Excellence um, and a professor of medicine for the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And he is going to talk to us today about coxie and tuberculosis. So Dr. Galgiani, I will let you take it over. So this is John Galgiani. Thank you very much for the introduction. I've been at the University of Arizona since 1978, and we formed the Valley Fever Center for Excellence in 1996. So we've been around for a while because, as I think I'll show you, it's a very important problem in Arizona, but it's also a pretty important problem nationally. And the, the audience today is, of course, not just restricted to my state, and uh, we'll try to address it in that manner. But what I'd like to do today primarily is to tell you how I kind of describe this disease inside the endemic region to the people here in Tucson and in Phoenix and the rest of the state of Arizona, which is pretty much how you might actually start seeing the patients in your clinics elsewhere as well. And I'll try to uh, show you how that might be the case. Uh, and then finish up with the overlap a little bit. I was very impressed with how many patients were overlapped. And when we get into the question and answer um, session, one of the questions I had was, when you diagnose CV, are you talking about does that include uh, just skin test positive, uh, or is, was it active TB along with COXI? But rather than to answer that question now, we can leave that for later. So let me start with my, first of all, I, uh, I have a no, nothing to disclose. Um, I um, would like to just start so we're all on the same page with this disease. As I think everyone understands, this is a fungal infection, and it's now, um, called uh, not just Coccidia oides inidus. I'm old enough that that was the only species in the genus uh, Coccidia oides, but now we have two species. And the way we got two species is not that they discovered a second one, but they split for genetic reasons. There are actually two clades within the genus, and so there's now a second species. And what's really interesting about that is Coccidia oides inidus is a species predominantly found in California, whereas C. pisadasii is found in Arizona, Texas, uh, everywhere else in the Western Hemisphere except California. And uh, I don't know if anyone's uh, driven between California and um, Arizona, but you know uh, winds blows back and forth between those two states. And yet this, uh, this demographic uh, uh, separation of the two species is quite stable, which probably speaks to the lack of our really uh, deep understanding of the ecology of these fungi uh, in the environment. The, um, the uh, name is coccidioidomycosis, but people have trouble saying that, um, and coxie is much easier to say. We're actually going to use that in a moment to talk about the, um, the uh, way to uh, discover and manage coxie. Uh, it's a useful acronym. The, the infection, um, probably in almost all cases, uh, starts with one spore. It's certainly possible to get high inoculum infections, uh, but probably most people don't do that. Archaeology digs, for example, there's some classic um, uh, high inoculum things, and everyone, 50% or, or so attack rates in a two-week period of time, but, but that's not the case with ambient infection. And single spores really is all it takes most of the time. But even with that kind of standard uh, uh, inoculation, uh, there's this wide spectrum of disease. Two out of three people, or roughly 60%, um, have no illness, uh, or at least nothing sufficient to go to the trouble of seeing a doctor. A third of people 
um, will have an illness, and that we're going to focus on that primarily today um, because it's the most common form. And then a small percentage, I've said 10%, but that's very generous. It's including uh, some some sequelae, which are really not terribly complicated, like uh, asymptomatic pulmonary nodules and thin wall cavities. Uh, but a small percentage go on to have uh, uh, fiber cavitary disease, uh, not dissimilar from the appearance that, that tuberculosis can give you, and also uh, bloodstream spread from the lungs to other parts of the body, most commonly brain, bone, and skin. And those are very complicated. Um, in fact, um, the, the overall outcome for everyone, uh, other than possibly these people with complications, is that after infection, you get lifelong immunity to second infections. Um, and actually, it's really interesting to wonder about whether that is even true for people with widely disseminated disease. And the implication of that it has a lot to do with whether a vaccine strategy would make biologic sense or not. Um, I happen to believe that, in fact, even the disseminated patients don't get second infections and they're left with the problems of their first infection, uh, but that's for another discussion. So this is the Center for Diseases Control um, map of the disease, intensely showing the areas that are known to be highly endemic. Um, but also you'll notice there's this little spot up uh, in southeastern Washington, which has been relatively recently discovered. Not shown here is, is a spot in the eastern part of Utah uh, in uh, Dinosaur National Park. So there are spots throughout the west uh, and maybe more that we haven't discovered yet uh, in addition to those areas that are uh, intensely endemic. Uh, you'll notice that we include here uh, West Texas. Uh, it turns out you might not know that if you look at national reporting because the state of Texas has uh, chosen not to report COXI, but these, these figures, this, this map is constructed primarily from 1950s skin test positivity data uh, by uh, Phyllis uh, Edwards. And, and we really quite clearly know that West Texas has it, even though it won't show up in NNWR statistics. We have, uh, oh, this is uh, an Arizonan's view of the United States, which I think you can see uh, is a little distorted, uh, perhaps. But, but for this disease, it is really quite appropriate because uh, I emphasize locally that two, two thirds of all U.S. infections. Um, maybe a little less now as California has been high, coming up a bit, but at least half, but probably most of the time, two-thirds of all U.S. infections occur in the state of Arizona. And the vast majority of those occur where the people live, which is in the 150 miles of Interstate 10 between Tucson and uh, Maricopa County around Phoenix. So it's, it's a very intensely endemic region for our state, and other points like uh, around Bakersfield and the Central Valley of California. But this is a really interesting map that was constructed by Kaylin Benedict uh, in a recent publication, EID, and shows you the, the, the tan spots are cases identified um, outside of the endemic region, and, um, and the red spots are the travel histories where those people have visited and brought back their infections where they uh, were diagnosed. So this is what I'm sort of suggesting, and even though we have a major endemic problem with this disease, uh, it's the, in Arizona is, I think, the second most frequently reported reportable disease, but anywhere in the country, because we travel and have business trips and other uh, excursions uh, to the endemic regions, uh, it's, um, it can be found across the entire country and, in fact, across the world. Uh, I talk to people in England and um, Japan and other places uh, that bring their infections back home after traveling. So this is this is an overview of, of what I was talking about in broad strokes. This is what we think of as the likely case uh, infection rates. It, it varies from year to year, but maybe roughly 150,000 people get infected, of which maybe a third of those seek medical attention. Uh, and then a, only a small portion of those uh, as the numbers you heard uh, in terms of reported cases in Arizona um, uh, are actually diagnosed. Uh, and then a even smaller por portion have this uh, bloodstream dissemination and an even smaller point, roughly 150 deaths per year um, in, in the United States. 
And it is these uh, disseminated and deaths that often take the, the focus because they're very dramatic. This is a fellow with bilateral paravertebral um, abscess is very much clinically looking like a staph aureus, but, but uh, actually was due to coccidioides. Uh, this is an anterior, the, the, the arrow to the left is an abscess from the base of the brain that had a sausage-like configuration all the way to the mid-thoracic level. Uh, so these are very extensive diseases uh, when they disseminate uh, frequently. But I, I'd like to also emphasize that the, the other group, the patients who um, go on to have uh, much less severe disease account for a lot of morbidity. It is not a trivial infection, and, um, and patients really suffer for large periods of time. For example, half of the people who are working um, lost greater than two weeks. Um, uh, Fifty percent of the illnesses last greater than four months. This is uh, primarily Arizona Department of Health Services data. Forty percent were hospitalized, and uh, a recent study from um, California showed the total cost of, of uh, valley fever in California in 2017 was 700 million. So I, I think overall, it's intensely endemic to small parts of the world, but it's still for the you know it's a fairly large economic burden uh, in those sites. So this is a slide which just shows you what I understand is how we are actually uh, addressing this disease uh, in Arizona. Uh, and uh, first of all, I, I mentioned that the disease has a lot of morbidity, and uh, this kind of shows you that desert rheumatism is a synonym because um, it is uh, a lot of joint pains, a lot of rheumatologic uh, 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 symptoms. Skin rashes such as e and enodosin are quite uh, significant. Uh, and it goes on for fairly long periods of time. Uh, and I've already told you some of those statistics. But in Arizona, we know from prospective studies, two small studies, one of us, one from here, UNF A, and one from uh, Mayo Clinic Scottsdale, that uh, about a quarter or a third of patients who develop community acquired pneumonia have that due to coxie. Uh, but uh, in a study from Arizona Department of Health Services, uh, it's found that less than 15% are actually tested for COXI uh, because of that diagnosis. Uh, and we, we have roughly 1,000 new uh, medical licenses issued each year in Arizona, but uh, only 12% received their MD from an Arizona school, and 40% um, had no postgraduate education uh, in the endemic region. And then a, a knowledge, aptitude, and... Uh, um, uh, practice uh, survey from Arizona Department of Health Services showed uh, that 80% uh, didn't know that it was reportable. Fortunately, it's laboratory reported, so I think the statistics are clearly quite good, um, and that there's no vaccine. Uh, and in fact, 40% of the group that actually returned the questionnaire, this is the group that felt comfortable enough to respond to the survey, um, were not confident as to what to do if they did diagnose a patient with valid fever. So that's, that's kind of the standard care uh, as practiced currently in my beloved state. Um, so, so we're trying to change that. Uh, and this is a little more evidence for uh, part of the problem. This is looking uh, using Banner Corporation data analytics at where in the three years, or almost three years, year to date for 2019, um, the diagnosis within Banner Health are being made. And look at how much, almost um, almost 70% of the diagnoses are being made after a patient's admitted to the hospital. And in orange, only 13% are made in primary care clinics. And I'm trying to change that because very much the people that are admitted uh, are admitted are get the right test and a day and a half later are discharged uh, with a management plan. They very likely, and many of them, probably don't need to be hospitalized. I'll also draw your attention over to the right, and you can see urgent care has almost no diagnosis being made, and this is really a problem. It, uh, emergency room is doing this somewhat better, but both of them are seeing a lot of valley fever. That's where they present. And um, it has something to do with the culture of not wanting to do uh, a study that doesn't come back before the patient uh, leaves, the, uh, leaves their clinic. Uh, but we need to change that because it, it contributes to the delay of diagnosis. And actually, the delay has been discovered or demonstrated in two separate studies, one 
This one by Rachel Jin uh, in Phoenix in Banner patients retrospectively showing that 95, uh, sorry, 45% uh, had greater than one month delay from the time they first presented to a healthcare facility, and a very different methodology study uh, published back to back in ID in September by Barry Donovan showed almost identical percent of a one month delay uh, in that population. So, so uh, the consequence of these delays is obviously unnecessary antibacterial drug use because uh, community acquired pneumonia gets treated with a antibacterial drug and often in our state repeatedly if, uh, if the patient continues to have symptoms. It, the older you are, the more you have protracted anxiety and fear with a, an illness uh, which no one can tell you exactly what it is, and that also leads leads to overutilization of many healthcare um, procedures and even um, uh, invasive procedures in some patients. So I have this simple hypothesis that earlier diagnosis would improve outcomes and reduce costs, and we're actually working quite aggressively on doing that. And one of the, the ways we're doing is we've constructed this manual, which is a nice short uh, cliff notes on, on Valley Fever, and it's available online Happy to send you hard copies if anyone wants to send me a request. Uh, they're available for distribution at uh, vfce.arizona.edu, and the links are at the bottom of the, at the uh, front page. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is kind of quickly go through, um, the um, using that acronym of COXI, the general approach that we, we are training within Banner and anyone else, for that matter, who, who wants to be trained. Uh, on how to uh, diagnose and treat this. And the first is you have to consider the diagnosis. Then uh, it's a laboratory diagnosis, so ordering the right test is appropriate. If you make a diagnosis, you have to look for risk factors and check again for complications. Um, and uh, if they aren't present at the primary care level, initiate the right uh, treatment. We're going to focus on the first four of these and be kind of thin on initiate since uh, for this audience, I'm thinking you're not going to be the ones primarily um, tasked with uh, ongoing management once the diagnosis is made, but uh, it's all laid out in that uh, primer that I just uh, uh, said. And there's actually a, a flow sheet that we have and would be happy to send you to going through this acronym, starting with consider the diagnosis. And, and here, uh, you have to think of it to make the diagnosis. And the syndrome um, is respiratory, muscular, and rashes, and I'll touch on that in just a moment, what I mean by that. You have to have endemic exposure. Of course, in Arizona, we've always got that, but uh, it sort of begs the question of getting a um, travel history as sort of part of the routine evaluation, and then um, that leads to ordering the right test. So here I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to need help here. Um, I think, Amelia, you're going to be my, my help with this. And the question is, have you diagnosed a patient with valley fever in the last 12 months? And it's, there's two possible answers, yes or no. And I'm, I'm going to leave it up for just a little bit longer. It looks like three quarters say no, uh, roughly. All right, let's go to the next one. Have you tested for valley fever in the last 12 months? Let's look at that one. This is the really interesting one. Amazingly, we've got a great response. This is a this is a ringer crew of roughly 50-50 uh, having tested. I want to show you this data. This is data from within Banner Health, um, and it's a little complicated, but I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, each bar is the number of clinicians in primary care who ordered a certain number of tests on the left axis going from 0 to 50. And you can see the first bar is uh, over 50 physicians of 223 ordered no tests in 2018. Um, this is in primary care only, uh, gen med and family medicine, not, not pediatrics, but uh, adult primary care. And then almost the same number ordered only one test in 2018. So 50% ordered two or less tests, 53% actually ordered two or less tests in the entire year. The interesting thing is a couple of things. First of all, notice there were some, though, that ordered a whole lot of tests, way up to, I think it reads, 76 in one, one physician or nurse practitioner. The dots on this thing are the percent positive of the tests 
that were that came back uh, from being ordered, going from zero to uh, I think it's 18 percent. And if you did a regression line on those dots, it's almost horizontal. The point being that the more you test, the more you're going to find in the endemic region. Or I would say, you guys, uh, if if you have a travel history. Uh, of uh, past uh, endemic exposure. So um, it speaks to the point that within Banner, we have a lot of improvement that we, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement here. <laughs> and and uh, and we are working on that. Um, and I think it's probably true, I, I have my hands on Banner data, but I'm pretty sure it's true throughout the state. Uh, so when I talk about uh, these three syndromes of respiratory or um, rheumatologic or, or rashes, uh, obviously not everyone who's got a cough, maybe everyone who's suspected of TB might be, um, should be tested. But I'm thinking of one or more office visit, if you think it's important to order a chest x-ray, or if you think you have a lower respiratory tract infection that needs an antibiotic. Those, I think, are good reasons uh, to add COXI to your differential with an endemic exposure. And, and, uh, and then if you have a couple of weeks or a week or so of fever, arthralgia, uh, fever fatigue, arthralgia, that, that might trigger it. I, I would emphasize that uh, for this disease, it is not always a respiratory disease. And unexplained uh, eosinophilia isn't a large number, but is, a, is certainly common if you see that in Arizona is due to coxy. And as I say, the skin lesions of enodosum or emultiformity. So, that's, so it's not everyone with the respiratory complaints, but, but I think you can see ones that you're taking more seriously. So if you're thinking of the diagnosis, then um, order the right test. So the test we are ordering uh, as a screening test is uh, the EIA. It's the cheapest test. It usually has the fastest turnaround, and it's the most sensitive of all the other tests. So that's what we're suggesting. And there's a lot of false positives. So after three weeks, if the patient's all better or the test was negative, there's no necessary, you know, maybe there's no reason to pursue it any further, but if they aren't all better, Repeating the test will up, up the likelihood you'll, you'll pick up the diagnosis if that's the case. So that's, that's what we're recommending for the ordering. I'm not going to go into details. We can, we can discuss it, but clearly you can make the diagnosis from cytology or from cultures as well, but the vast majority of infections are made serologically. And um, there are just two overarching rules. So we could spend a lot more time on uh, the details around coxy serology, but but if you can just remember that any positive test is very likely to be an important uh, of some significance. There are a few false positives, but if you're ordering a test because of an ill patient, um, that COXI uh, serology is most likely uh, giving you a diagnosis. Um, but the other side, as I sort of mentioned already, is a negative test never rules out valley fever. It's, it's, um, it's very common to have false negatives. Uh, even in well-established disease, even with uh, uh, culture-proven disease, uh, that can happen. And uh, serologies, uh, repeating them can up your sensitivities. So let's suppose you diagnose COXI one way or another. Uh, then uh, the first thing to do is look for risk factors. And if you have risk factors, that ups the, the game quite a bit because they become much more likely to be complicated. And the risk factors... Uh, for pulmonary complications, diabetics are more likely to, to cavitate, and anyone with uh, cardiopulmonary compromise will have a problem uh, with a respiratory disease, uh, COXI included. Um, and um, the real risk factors, though, that we think of is with disseminated disease. And the overwhelming uh, driver here is CMI, cell-mediated immunity, or pregnancy, especially the third trimester. So AIDS patients, organ transplants, Biologic response modifier um, um, uh, therapy receiving patients. Those are the big drivers of extra pulmonary dissemination, and that makes that much more of a subspecialty referral rather than general primary care uh, management. The, the others, some of which you, you think of, males are more likely to get disseminated disease than females. We talk a lot about African Americans and Filipinos having an increased risk of dissemination. Most People who see this disease a lot think that's true, and it likely is. But in fact, it's a relatively small effect. Uh, maybe if it's a six-fold increase of risk of dissemination, and if the risk of dissemination is actually half a percent, that 
up to 3%, um, and still 97% would have not disseminated disease. Um, so it's, it's, it's maybe real, but it's a, a small effect uh, risk factor. And, and finally, kids do better with this disease, I think, than um, adults, and you see much more disseminated disease in adult patients. So, so the other thing to do is check for complications. In contrast to tuberculosis, um, most complications in COXI occur uh, most frequently um, uh, in the first weeks to months after the infection uh, is started. So if you go months to a year or so and there are no complications after no treatment, uh, and this is all pre-antifungal data we're discussing here, the chances are that person is never going to have a complication, with the possible exception if they then become severely immunosuppressed. Um, and um, most of those complications can be picked up on a quick review of systems or a physical exam. It doesn't really require an extensive laboratory screening. Uh, I can show you some examples. I've already shown you some before of disseminated disease. This is an elbow of somebody with disseminated coxie. Um, a third toe obviously has an ulcerative lesion. Uh, here is a synovial cyst uh, that uh, was aspirated and grew coxie. Um, all of those, here's a fourth digit in a kid with disseminated osteomyelitis. Um, all of these, um, I, don't, I couldn't tell you from the looks of those that I knew it was coxie, but they all pretty much uh, really uh, uh, cry out for a skin biopsy or a, a, some sort of tissue examination. Uh, so, so to summarize that, uh, most complications are focal. It's not just feeling lousy. You see things or people point to a problem. And the review of systems and quick exam will pick them up. And, uh, and then uh, you do what you need to do, depending on what you find, uh, to evaluate them further to see if, in fact, it's related to a coxie. So that's kind of the summary of this acronym. Consider the diagnosis, do the testing, check for risk factors and for complications. And if those are not present, um, then initiate management. Um, and what I, if you have uncomplicated, uh, un, uh, you know, no disseminated disease, no risk factors, we suggest continued follow-ups. Uh, as I say, all of this is laid out much more extensively in that little notebook, that, that training manual that I cited. A serial bottle with, uh, uh, weight loss is frequent early on in the disease, but it plateaus and, and comes back over a period of weeks usually, uh, check for new signs and symptoms. We repeat antibody tests because uh, they tend to go away over time and follow up chest x-rays and lateral, uh, PA and laterals are probably all you really need rather than using CAT scans to follow these patients. And I think most people do not need treatment. Um, and uh, this is how you manage people after a diagnosis with respect to treatment is, uh, is not a settled issue. In the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America practice guidelines that are now just over three years old, there is this uh, statement. It should be emphasized that no randomized trials exist to assess whether antifungal treatment either shortens the illness of early uncomplicated coxie infections or prevents uh, later complications. We just do not have the data. So obviously, in the absence of data, there's lots of opinions of what to do best. What we, we, we know from at least this one non-randomized study that Neil Ann Pell conducted at the Tucson VA a few years ago was that uh, comparing a group of treated and untreated, and what you're shown here is the box plot of the time on the vertical axis to a 50% reduction of the baseline abnormalities. And you can see that whatever they had at the time they were enrolled into this study to the time they got better by 50%, there's essentially no difference between the treated and untreated group. And furthermore, looking at the not treated group, none of them went on to develop complications versus of the 51 that were treated, um, there were several that had relapses of which um, relapses and three extra pulmonary uh, uh, disseminated relapses occurred up to two years after stopping treatment. I've had one that went on seven years before we discovered he had a uh, T7 thoracic vertebrae uh, uh, lytic lesion due to coxy. Um, so treatment does have the effect of changing the natural history, and that's actually a consideration as to what to do. So I, I said that I was going to just touch on um, the fact that these two diseases uh, maybe not infrequently will show up in uh, TB clinics uh, for a reason that they might look a lot like 
um, um, tuberculosis patients. Uh, night sweats, weight loss, hemoptysis, fatigue are very common symptoms with conoxy, as are in TB. Um, you probably have patients already treated with antibacterial drugs uh, before they get uh, referred for TB consideration. And ch chest x-rays can be surprisingly similar in many patients. Here's a couple. These are all COXI patients. I'll give the answer away right off the top. Uh, here's one. Uh, here's another one. Here's a third. And I think you could say this could certainly be tuberculosis. Uh, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me uh, in the discussion. So I do have this data that Orion McConnor gave me, uh, and I'd heard uh, him present um, several years ago from um, the, uh, I think this was the Border uh, Infectious Disease Surveillance Group. Uh, and basically, there is a, a flow diagram, which was basically patients suspected of tuberculosis were then subjected to COXI antibody testing. Um, and uh, this was done in a number of uh, parts of Mexico, but looking specifically at the Sonora data uh, back in 2012-2013, 17 percent of those suspected of tuberculosis syndromically uh, were found to be seropositive for COXI. So, so they certainly had an overlap in their in their active uh, uh, tuberculosis patients. So, I also uh, point to this uh, beautiful uh, rendition that was put up by the. Uh, 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 Arizona, uh, New York, New Mexico um, uh, Health Department, uh, because I think it really uh, tells it very nicely. And, and I think with that, I'm going to thank you and uh, pass the baton on uh, to somebody else. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Galgiani. That was very um, informative and interesting. And um, we appreciate your time and sharing your um, immense knowledge. And now we wanted to have um, a little bit of a conversation between you and um, Dr. Marcos Burgos. He is the professor of medicine at University School, uh, University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He's also the TB medical director for New Mexico Department of Health and the infectious disease um, hospitalist attending at the VA here in um, New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, Marcos, are you available? And can you share a little bit of your thoughts? Um, about tuberculosis and COXI from your experience? Uh, yes, uh, that, that, those were uh, excellent presentations. Thank you, Dr. Gaudiani. So from uh, the TB perspective, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, an easier uh, way to diagnose tuberculosis that actually uh, it is uh, many times with uh, COXI as well as it is more black and white for us in terms of when to treat or not to treat uh, for active tuberculosis uh, than it is uh, with COXI. Um, for us in, in those states where uh, TB and COXI or COXI is endemic, um, we all, always find uh, very interesting that uh, patients may have coccidiomycosis as well as tuberculosis. But one of the things that we find uh, very useful in the presentation, especially with pulmonary disease, it is uh, cavitary disease with uh, smears that are uh, AFB negative. So for us, when we see a cavity and we see that the smears are negative for tuberculosis, we always suspect uh, coccidiomycosis, and we send the serologies. One of the limitations that we have uh, in uh, as per se in New Mexico, is that the State Department, the, the Health Department, uh, doesn't have availability for COXI serologies. So basically, we have to send the COXI serologies through either other, other methods, other insurance, uh, but we don't have it with the Department of Health. That, that limits uh, for us um, diagnosing probably patients that we're not suspecting with COXI. Something that I would want, uh, I wanted to do for a long time was all patients with tuberculosis to, uh, to uh, test also for coccidiomycosis, and we have not been able to do that. So a couple of questions for you, Dr. Gargiani, in terms of uh, from the tuberculosis perspective. In terms of risk factors, um, one of the biggest risk factors for us for tuberculosis is foreign-born uh, with respect to the incidence of tuberculosis being higher 
in most of our foreign-born, especially people from uh, Mexico. Do you find, uh, in terms of coccidiomycosis in Arizona, more patients or from Mexico, uh, or is it uh, the same risk factors as exposure there in Arizona? Yeah, great question. Uh, could I let me? I'd like to maybe gently respond to your the issue, which I completely understand as being real, that uh, you can't get the state lab to do coccyx serology for you in New Mexico. In fact, um, there are Arizona Department of Health people on the line, and correct me if I'm wrong, but at the moment now we just don't do that either uh, in Arizona Department of Health. The, the, the point I'd like to make is. If you had a patient who was skin test positive, had the x-ray, the suspected tuberculosis, even cavitary, and if they were smear negative, there's a possibility they still have tuberculosis, right? And so wouldn't you treat, I mean, you have a management issue there around the TB. And I would think that might come up, it's certainly not anywhere near a majority, it's a small percentage, but each one of those cases would have a cost in management and in fact, I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting is it might be possible that the public health uh, budget should expand to include EIA um, testing, even if it's to a commercial lab, because of the cost savings, getting that positive on patients that are smear negative uh, would get you in terms of downstream management from that point. Uh, does that sound like something to think about, uh, or do you think I'm off base here? I, I completely agree with you. Uh, the problem it has been from the perspective of the finances of the Department of Health in what we're told about. Yeah. I'm talking about New Mexico. Right. Well, we, we in the two papers I sub, uh, mentioned from EID, it's clearly a different practice, but we looked at the cost of doing more COXI serologies in primary care. And there was a very substantial savings in terms of downstream medical costs. Uh, I understand you're not responsible for most of those in the clinic, but even so, I would think there would be downstream management issues in a patient where you didn't have a diagnosis and you couldn't really confidently rule out uh, TB. There might be direct observation uh, management and so forth, which if you could save 10% of those because, or maybe even 30% of those, because they're not TB at all, active TB anyway, uh, you might save a lot of money, or at least enough to justify the serologies. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to convince the, 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 the people that made those, the, those decisions here. Great. Um, the um, other question that you have uh, in terms of uh, uh, people uh, from south of the border coming in, um, Having, we don't see an overrepresentation, frankly. Coxie is endemic here, so we see it in everybody. <laughs> in fact, this also speaks to, uh, to uh, uh, industrial exposures, people who are working in the dirt, uh, you know, uh, people who put up uh, electrical poles or, or agricultural workers. Uh, there are examples where there are outbreaks, some notable examples from occupational exposure. Uh, there's no question that happens, but the fungus, it turns out, is very sparsely distributed, even within the intensely endemic region. So, so much of the construction work um, doesn't actually impose much risk at all because the construction is where the fungus is not. And, and so people in my clinic, this is anecdotal, uh, but uh, I just see no overrepresentation of um, any uh, – kind of work. And, and similarly, I, I don't see uh, it's an equal opportunity uh, disease. I think the Arizona Department of Health Service found in their enhanced questionnaire survey that uh, on that study, I think they showed that the insurance distribution of reported cases were exactly the same distribution as the total population of the state of Arizona. So it, 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 anybody can get this. Another point that I wanted to make to what you said about the the Cavitari disease with a smear negative, what we usually do is we think about coxy, but of course we continue thinking about tuberculosis. But now we're lucky to have PCR for TV. So uh, when we send the sputum, 
And, uh, you know, if the PCRs are negative, even if an AFP is negative, you know, most of the time we're able to rule out TB, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with confidence in that setting. Before we used to have the PCR, so uh, we were not able to do that now. But uh, what we find is those that are smear negative and PCR negative, um, you know, those are the ones that we want to send the, uh, the, the coccyx serologies as soon as possible, not to delay the diagnosis. Gotcha. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Or, or others that were on the on this call? Um, I was I brought up the question right at the beginning. Um, when you talk about co-infection with TB and COXI, uh, just, I'd, I'd be interested to know how much of that co-infection is uh, with an X-ray like the ones I showed that have fibrocavitary disease or whether much of that co-infection is uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, skin test or uh, uh, um, laboratory uh, ser serum, serology uh, positive or Cytokine positive. You mean for tuberculosis? Yeah. There was a 9% nine percent with co-infection was what I saw on the slide at the front of this presentation. I assume that was a, a active disease, active, active tuberculosis. I, I, I don't know if I'm correct or not. Yes, you're correct. The case review we did was just purely active tuberculosis disease compared to the COXI group. That's great. Thank you for that. I, I, I'm amazed. I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah. I, I Frankly, here in New Mexico, I don't think it is that high. Uh, we are, uh, I don't know if in Albuquerque, which is the biggest city in New Mexico, is considered high endemicity for COXI because we're at greater than 5,000 feet elevation. But, um, but we see COXI here as well, but not in the numbers that uh, they see in Arizona. And I will say, and I, I, this is not, not data, this is a personal experience, probably only two to three percent of our TB cases have COXI, no more than that. Yes, and there are a lot of questions. So yes, we will get started with that. And I was going to take just one really brief moment to talk about the poster that um, um, several of the presenters had. Um, this was a you know collaboration through the New Mexico Department of Health TV program and the Office of Border Health. And it was done, um, they were uh, posters and also billboards that were posted on both sides of the border down in the Las Cruces, El Paso, and then um, in, in also in Mexico. Um, the lovely lady with the white hair on the right was one of our former TV nurse consultants here in New Mexico, um, Benita Cook. So I just wanted to throw that in. And then um, Travis Leva is one of our Department of Health employees that's on the um, left, and he is the director of the Office of Border Health now. So just to um, brag a little bit on New Mexico and give some background um, on that poster. Um, but we do have a lot of questions. So I will go ahead and I'm going to start. Um, at the top of the list, and hopefully we can get through as many as possible. Um, what proportion of the dual diagnosis are culture-confirmed COXI? And um, Dr. Galgiana, you might be able to answer this one. And then, Evan, I don't know if you want to address this maybe for Ar the Arizona data that you have. Um, but, um, Dr. Galgiana, do you want to take first crack at this one? I think Evan really should uh, own that space. I don't have any any uh, immediate information on those proportions? Uh, so for Arizona, I believe we looked only at having a positive reported COXI lab. I don't think we uh, actually took another dig into the type of positive lab that was reported. So I'm not sure about uh, proportion of culture positivity. You know, okay. that's Thank an interesting you. point, Evan. And it would be fun to look at the breakdown of what actual serologic results were the evidence for COXI. And this gets into this question of, of false positives that I see on the list that some people are talking about, which we could maybe uh, address more head on in a moment. But but it would be interesting to know, obviously, how many of them were isolated IgMs um, in the people who were diagnosed uh, active tuberculosis. And um, in that same regard, if I were taking care of a patient who uh, they ruled out coxie, I'm sorry, ruled out tuberculosis or, or had tuberculosis, let's say, let me put it that way, that were, were being treated for tuberculosis, um, I would actually 
want to go to the trouble of getting cultures of sputum. Routinely, if coccyx is in that cavity, um, you can typically find it uh, on a sputum, just as you can with TB, with uh, 3 a.m. sputums. Um, and um, it changes management significantly, and uh, there are drug interactions, uh, so that the idea if you need help need to treat coxy with an antifungal or an azole, uh, that will impact your TB treatment. So, so I'd want to be on more than uh, serologic grounds uh, before I uh, treat it for both. And I'm going to jump down to a question since you brought up the um, IgM and the EIA. There's a question a little bit farther down. It said that you mentioned some false positives on the EIA, and they were wondering, is that for IgM? Um, and does the IgG remain positive after resolved infection? And how long does the IgM persist after acute infection? So that's a three-prong question, I think. Great. So, so I, I tried to make the case, I'm going to reinforce that here, that any either IgG or IgM being positive is very likely related to current disease or recent disease as a general statement. And I'm, I'm doing that in the context of somebody who presents with a syndrome that looks like it could be coxy, and then you do the test. The pre-test probability that that positive is true is really quite high. And the, the specific concern has been mostly around, the vast majority has been around this EIA IgM. And there are examples of that being truly false, uh, false positive. But uh, I saw uh, a comment in here from Oren uh, McCotter just a moment ago pointing out, and there's a, pu a publication from the CDC that showed the actual rate of false positivity go taking sera out of Puerto Rico, as I recall, and then blood bank specimens uh, from Maricopa County. Uh, we showed that the uh, the more very low rates of false positivity in, in the Puerto Ricans, where you, presumably none of them had prior coxy infection, and it was only slightly higher in Maricopa County or Phoenix area of uh, blood bank uh, specimens where we had uh, healthy people. In fact, some of that might actually be related to a uh, subclinical infection. Uh, there, there, there have been publications. Uh, there's methodology issues around this, and so um, those tests are done. Uh, they're EIAs, uh, and there could be differences in wash steps by different equipment or different technicians, which might influence local false positivities. Uh, but I, I would say operationally not to assume that it's a high rate, and and um, and the IgG tends to, all of them tend to go away over time. Uh, there are exceptions to that, but generally it's not like rubella IgG. It doesn't stay positive for life. Um, the tests tend to all be phase reactants. Okay. Thank you very much. And just kind of a follow-up, you said that typically everyone, once they've been infected, they do have lifelong immunity. So even if the um, IgG goes away, they're still considered immune? Yep, that's correct. Uh, the, 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 everyone, I think, generally believes that the, the protection you get from infection uh, after infection is cell-mediated immune uh, mechanisms, has uh, essentially, very little evidence, if any. I know of one mouse study, uh, but other than that, there's no evidence that um, antibodies play a role in protection. It, it tends to be more proportional to the fungal burden, so uh, the fact it goes away is actually a good sign. Or it correlates with uh, better protection rather than worse protection. Oh, okay. And um, the next question, and maybe um, – because the question relates to um, Dr. Galgiani, if you can talk about uh, epidemiology of coxie, which you did somewhat already, but particularly areas um, that are prevalent, but what exposure a northeastern easterner could have to be at risk for coxie? So this map might be helpful as you um, give some background information on that. Sure. So um, that you mean the northwestern one or the northeastern? Uh, one? I think. I think it's folks in the Northeast, I think they were wondering what their potential um, risk for coxie would be, which yeah. would probably be travel. Yes. So the, all of those tan-colored spots in the North and East, they those lines are drawn primarily to the Phoenix-Tucson area, also to uh, the Central Valley, probably mostly to Bakersfield, that general area. And... 
they are getting infected in the Southwest uh, and take, coming home and then get their diagnosis in the states <laughs> that they live in. Uh, the incubation time is one to three weeks. Uh, so the acute infection, uh, you know, easily cannot start becoming symptomatic until you finished your vacation. Uh, there's also there's that nice little spot up in the north northwest uh, uh, suggesting maybe uh, that it was traveled to the northwest. I don't know. Orion McCotter's on the call, and he could if he wants to unmute. Uh, maybe Orion, you could if you have any further information on this map. Yeah, I, I would just say yeah, the large majority of, of cases do occur in the, the southwest. Um, I, actually, maybe the other map that that Dr. Galgiani had uh, would be helpful for answering that question on some of the hyper-endemic areas, which really end up being south, southern Arizona and central Central Valley, California, um, although there are uh, some locally acquired cases that have now occurred as far north as Washington State, and we're certainly looking at expanding geographic range for this disease, and I think, you know, some of the mantra that, that uh, was also being talked about from New Mexico that even in some of those higher elevation places, we do think that there probably are some smaller, lower levels of locally acquired cases being found. And let me draw attention to that spot on this map in Texas. And um, there was actually a publication, a, a case report of a little kid who had cryptic uh, hydrocephalus, and it took a year for them to figure out it was coxie meningitis causing that. And then the question was, where did he get it? And after there was questions about whether it came from Marin County, California, in the Bay Area, but it ended up that it was uh, and genetics on the strain, the isolate from this little kid uh, confirmed this, that it came from uh, a Texas source. It was Beeville, uh, which is south, a little south and west of uh, San Antonio, if I get my uh, geography correct, and it's quite farther east than you might think of El Paso or things. And that's actually been published, have an outbreak of coxie in, in Beeville, Texas, before. But none of that, but that was back in the 1970s, and none of that information is available to uh, clinicians uh, in Texas because because it's not brought forward as by policy uh, within uh, Texas Health. And I would just say that uh, we'd love to see them um, expand to just look at this disease along with us because it's an important problem for their West Texas uh, people. I might just throw out a little question for all of our listeners that they could maybe respond to the chat box. Is um, which states is COXI reportable in? Um, I didn't realize until you mentioned today that it wasn't in Texas. So um, that might be an interesting question to find out for the different states if they could respond. Um, if it is reportable in their state or not, um, just a little impromptu epi information. So, um, and I know um, Curry Center will keep um, all the chat responses, so maybe they can gather that information and share it back. And a lot of folks are putting that in the chat box now, too. This is Orion McCotter with CDC and the Mycotic Diseases. And we do have a list of all the states where it is reportable uh, currently. So it's reportable in 29 states. Uh, okay. In 2019. Thank you. That was a, you gave a quick answer to that question. <laughs> um, and um, Dr. Galgian, and you mentioned pediatric patients, so I'm going to hop down to a question um, about pediatrics. It was wondering if you have any data for pediatric patients compared to adult patient diagnosis with coxie. Let's see. In broad strokes, um, they don't cavitate, I think, nearly as often, which is interesting. There's there's to date, there's no there's no evidence for genetic predisposition to pulmonary cavitation, like there is evidence for uh, immunogenetic predispositions to disseminated coxy. And the fact that diabetics are predisposed to cavitary disease, I see that not so much as an immuno uh, difference of diabetics, but probably a metabolic difference, and there may be that in fact the lung is a target organ for diabetes and, and that COXI brings that out and it, it demonstrates that. And, and it, my sense is that probably pediatric patients have younger lungs that don't resolve their infection with complete necrosis of parts, which is the way the cavity forms. 
So that's that's a difference. I've mentioned that I don't think they are as frequent getting disseminated coxie. And in fact, a uh, review uh, that Cami Odio published in CID about case reports uh, through the past eight, 60 years of uh, coxie uh, indicated that patients, p uh, kids with disseminated coxie were more likely to find actually a Mendelian mutation responsible for their disseminated disease. So, so I, I would say that kids who develop disseminated coxie could be, you know, actually we're, we're actively studying the genetics of why some people get disseminated disease, and I would say it's, it's more likely to find it uh, in kids than it is in adults. But other than that, uh, they get pneumonias like uh, adults do, and I think pediatricians, uh, I, I think they get better, and probably the underdiagnosis is just as frequent in pediatrics as it is in, in adult medicine. Okay, thank you. And then um, the next question, they were wondering um, if both types occur in Mexico or which type was more prominent. And I'm not going to try to um, say those two types because I probably messed it up, but I know you mentioned that at the beginning of your presentation. Right. In Mexico, almost all of it is Coxidioides pisidaceae. In Tijuana uh, and that part of Mexico, uh, there's overlap areas uh, with an imidus. Uh, it can be found there, but it, but there again, it's hard to know in in these situations whether it was you know we're talking about isolates not from the soil primarily, but isolates from patients, um, and they might have acquired the disease in California and then traveled and got diagnosed in Mexico or vice versa. But it's it is geographically pretty much all in California where you find imidus. Imidus. There's incidentally at this point no difference in the clinical manifestations that's been identified between the two species, and everything suggests that there's cross protection. So if you get valley fever uh, infections in California, you're probably protected against the other species, C. pisidaceae as well. But genetically, they're actually quite similar. That there are clear differences, but it's it's not huge differences in the genome. Thank you. And then I'm going to jump down. Uh, you have spoken about this before, about once people are infected, then they do have immunity. But there was a question about if somebody is immunosuppressed. Will that yeah. affect whether they have continued immunity to coxie? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, so um, you can you can get recurring disease. There's sort of the, the concept that is not completely certain that most people who get over valley fever are actually not are not cured of the infection, that there are resident spherules still in tissue that remain dormant lifelong. And there are, there are notable sort of case reports. For instance, there was one patient who uh, moved from the United States to Spain and 13 years later had, had disseminated coxie as his AIDS-defining diagnosis in Spain where he'd been out of any possibility of an endemic exposure for 13 years. And people who have nodules that are suspected of being cancer are taken out. You can grow coxie out of those pulmonary nodules on a routine basis. So it's clear that, that if you get an organ transplant uh, or a, uh, you know, profound AIDS infection, there's a possibility you'll have recurrence. In fact, as I recall, about half, I can't remember, it's just over, just under half, of this is pre-heart, that about half of the uh, AIDS-defining diagnoses, when COXI was the AIDS-defining diagnoses, were outside of the endemic region. So it is clearly possible to have that. Less clear is what is very common now, which is uh, the use of biologic response modifiers. They clearly are immunosuppressive, and there's a black box warning on Humira and, and drugs like that of saying, that you should worry about coxie. And for, on the evening news, uh, there's this cryptic uh, comment, tell your doctor if you've visited places where certain fungal infections are common. And they're talking about Tucson <laughs> or Phoenix uh, or, or Bakersfield, uh, among other things. And um, we're interested, actually, in finding out how to manage those patients because uh, a lot of those uh, biologic response modifiers are in use. And the question is how, how to use them safely. Uh, where coxie is prevalent. Thank you. That was interesting about the biologics. I do remember hearing that on the commercials that hadn't necessarily connected it with valley fever. 
Um, right, pretty cryptic. Let's see, and then the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know what patients would probably be even aware that that would be what they're supposed to be telling their doctor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Is there any cross reactivity between COXI and TB diagnostic testing in co-infected? I don't believe so. Okay. I think I can be pretty simple about that. I just don't know of any cross reactivity. Okay. I guess, That's helpful. I guess the, the, well, I don't know. Um, pimerosol was a preservative in the past. It's no longer used in skin testing for COXI. I don't know if it's still used in, in any uh, TB skin tests, but Back then, that that was, you know, you can get sensitization to the mercury, but but uh, other than that, there's nothing about the, the the fungal antigen versus the mycobacterial antigen. Okay, and the next question: Given that a large proportion of COXI cases are asymptomatic or subclinical, in TB cases with positive COXI tests and negative COXI culture studies, do you treat for both? or just observe for COXI while treating TB? I pretty much would do the latter. If you don't have evidence of, so it depends what we're talking about. If you have fibrocavitary pulmonary disease and you know that TB is part of that because the smears are positive or PCR is positive, then that's the question whether you have positive sputum cultures for, for, for COXI. If you have both, then, personally, I would probably start TB treatment and see how things went. And if everything went swimmingly and the patient got better and symptoms went away, I would continue that. But because not all cavities with coxy in them cause disease. And they often more fester than are relentlessly progressive. So I think you have time to work on that myself. But, you know, depending on how sick they are, uh, in that situation, you might make a decision to treat both because it seems prudent. If they don't, if you're talking about a smear, you know, a, a asymptomatic TB diagnosis without a chest X-ray abnormality, then I would try hard not to treat coxie if there were no symptoms that you thought were attributable to that. Okay, and let's see. I think we have time for one more question. They they were asking, what do I tell an asymptomatic COXI patient, um, positive patient who has tested for transplant purposes? Our Department of Health goes over signs and symptoms review, but it's basically a cold call to tell a person who may not have even heard of the positive COXI test results from their pri provider. Right. So if you are, you're talking about an organ transplant. Yes, that's what I think so. Yes, that's what I'm okay. getting from the question. So if you're talking about a solid organ transplant, we would recommend routinely, this comes up all the time, a screening test for COXI, even if they're asymptomatic, uh, if that screening test is positive, because it tends to be a phase reactant, we would presume and treat as if that person had a relatively recent infection and at the time of transplantation, they would routinely be treated with uh, fluconazole at a higher dose than they would. In Arizona, the, the treatment uh, protocol that is promulgated and is reflected in the IDSA guidelines is uh, to treat everybody at the time of organ transplantation with 200 milligrams of fluconazole for the first year uh, because they live in Arizona. But in the patient you're talking about with a positive urology pre-transplant, we would not contraindicate the transplant, but at the time of transplantation, have as part of their regimen uh, 400 milligrams of fluconazole for some period of time, at least a year, and make decisions downstream from that. And they would need to be treated pre-transplant? No. We, there's really no advantage if they have no symptoms and no evidence of active disease uh, because the treatment doesn't cure. Unfortunately, our drugs are not nearly as good as what you have for TB. Uh, it inhibits the fungus, but it's a static effect. There's no eradication of the fungus however long you treat with uh, azoles or even amphotericin. So, so the plan would be essentially at the time of transplantation to, to start the treatment. Actually, because of the drug interactions, the the uh, the dosing of the uh, anti-rejection uh, regimen is reduced substantially, like a half to a quarter of what would otherwise be needed. And so there's a, actually a considerable cost savings by using fluconazole in tandem with the with the transplantation. 
And let's see, I think maybe one more question, and this may be a follow-up to the biologic. It says, in, in endemic areas, are persons undergoing immunosuppression for a biologics? Do you screen for COXI like you do for TB? We we recommend, and this is in the – we follow the guidelines, and the guidelines, the IDSA guidelines would say uh, screen prior to starting the biologic and make – Management decisions if it's positive around that, but but once the biologic is started, we recommend not screening people who look like they're not having an active coxie infection. We we the, actually the guidelines recommend not doing annual screenings. I think TB screening. You guys could talk about that more than I could. You might argue for it because it changes things so much once you get a positive, but you could argue you know. Um, what's the percentage findings? Somebody else might want to speak to that other than me. Uh, Marcos, I don't know if you're still on, if you wanted to say, address anything as far as the, from the TB perspective on that. Sorry, I missed that question, uh, Dan. Oh, it was just about, there was a question about screening for COXI if somebody was going to start on biologics. And um, just, I think basically, yes, for TB, we definitely do screen them. But Dr. Galgiani was saying for COXI, if they're not symptomatic, then not necessarily the recommendation isn't to screen for COXI. Maybe there isn't much more to say there. Not to screen every year. We we ask we not screen every year. recommend screening before starting, but not 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 after that. I was just wondering, okay. TB, do you screen every year? Just keep doing it once a year while on biologics. Uh, not unless you're at high risk for a TB infection. So if you if you re exposed to TB, yes. Uh, or if you are from a high highly endemic area, yes. But if you're not, uh, just once is sufficient. Great. That makes sense. Okay. So thank you to all of the speakers today. This was um, tremendously interesting and informative for me. And I appreciate everyone's time and preparation that they put into their presentations today and for all of the folks that joined us. I'm going to hand it back over to um, Amelia for the um, closing comments.